Hey everyone, I'm Rob Franick. I'm Editor-in-Chief here at The Prince Review, and it is a pleasure to be teeing up today's conversation in which we'll be covering subjects all laser focused on our promised topic of road mapping for college and beyond. But let's skip all the pesky preamble and jump right in. Now school, we know it, but we should say it out loud, can be overwhelming. We know that classes and homework and demanding teachers and extracurricular activities are incredibly important and also incredibly weighty in a student's life and that's just the official stuff related to school you your family undoubtedly have lots of stuff to do outside of school it can very well seem like your kids barely have enough time for family as well as some friends we've seen all sorts of stressors from our perch at the princeton review beginning in earnest in middle school and it only increases as students move on to high school that all said Thinking about what comes after high school adds an extra layer of possible stressors to the mix. College may seem like a long way off, and you may think that you don't need to worry about it just yet, but the message that myself and our full team for the Prince Review have been shouting from the education rooftops for a long time is that the earlier that your children and you put in the effort to succeed, of course, in middle school and high school, the less stressful the transition to college will be. And if you can get your child to think about middle school and high school academics and what they can mean for the world of college admission, well then, with mathematical certainty, it can make their classes far less stressful. So today, friends, we'll discuss how middle school and high school academics affects the college admission process. As I said before, my name is Rob. I'm editor-in-chief at the Princeton Review. I spend a ton of time in any given academic year also given our COVID year, spending the year talking to three groups, students, parents, and counselors. I counted up just for geeky fun before uh, this recording, how many live events I gave pre-COVID uh, a little over a year ago, 107. That number is far dwarfed by the amount I'm giving online now nowadays, but suffice it to say that our Princeton Review team has been in business down just a smidge over 40 years. And in any number of ways, we've been giving this message out to students and parents and counselors that entire time. So friends, in this presentation, we'll focus on three main areas. The first, and it's the most important point, um, is the most important thing that we should know about the college admission process. I'll be spending a lot of time talking about that, so be prepared, spoiler alert on that. <laughs> um, idea number two is your middle school and your high school journey, and ideal number three, what you can do right now. Now, when we're done today, you will without question exit this virtual room with certainty of how to help your children get good grades that they need to get into their dream colleges <laughs> while bringing you and them a ton less stress in the process. When it comes to college admission, there is one thing that is more important than literally everything else in the process. Honestly, if you leave today's discussion remembering just this one thing, then this is it. This one most important thing of the process simply doesn't waver. It doesn't matter, folks, whether you're applying to a big school, a small school, a public school, a private school, religious, not religious, you're getting my point. And as you might imagine, very, very little unites the college admission process in quite the same way. Whichever kind of school your kids, your students are ultimately going to apply to, admission teams will look at this one thing more than anything else. Friends, there's no doubt in my mind that you have some guesses about what that one most important thing in college admission likely is, and there are plenty of things that your child will be doing when they apply to college. Actually completing college admission applications, asking teachers for letters of recommendation, asking counselors for information about colleges when we're starting the research process. They may also have to write essays or a, a one essay or a multiple essays. There are, of course, other things that could help, like visiting a college, whether that's virtual or in person, doing an actual interview, virtual or in person as well. If you have a student athlete, then they're likely going to go through the recruiting process through that particular athletic channel. If your child is a performing artist, then you'll likely find that they have to audition. If your child is a visual artist, they may have to submit a portfolio for evaluation. Friends, amongst all of this admission soup, the most important thing for college admission are grades, your high school grades. Admission counselors care first and foremost about what grades a student receives in school. Now, we know 
that they only get to see grades that students earn during high school. But that's not where good grades start. Middle school is where that foundation is built. The best thing is that this is not something that students start worrying about in high school. Research shows that building a strong foundation for good study habits and understanding the value of education as early as middle school can make such a significant difference. Now, don't get me wrong. Everything else matters as well, just not as much as all mighty grades in the college process. Friends, it's important to say it right out loud. We are not guessing about what admission teams consider important. We know this because of NACAC. Now, that might be an acronym that you're not familiar with. Now, NACAC stands for the National Association for College Admission Counseling. It is the definitive membership organization for college admission, and it released a survey called The State of College Admission. No surprise, it gives an overview of college admission in the United States. Now, we have a link to that directly here in the deck. It is important to check it out <laughs> if you're inclined. Now, the most important, the most recent finding, I should say, for this report is in November of 2019. And obviously, there have been deep, deep changes in the world of college admission since then, but there are bedrock things that simply have not changed, my friends, specifically how admission teams are reviewing applications for freshman admission. And as I already told you, the number one factor is high school grades that is more important now than ever. Now, the five key factors, the five key findings that the NACAC survey revealed, number one, grades in college preparatory courses. Now that means colleges care more about English and math grades than they care about required health courses. But please do not think that health classes don't matter. Colleges also care about grades and courses in general. That is the second biggest factor finding in the NACAC survey. So whatever grade your students, your kids receive in whatever courses that matters. The third biggest factor is the strength of the curriculum itself. Now, straight A's are always what college admission teams across the country want to see, but they would look sideways if a student received all A's without taking a single AP, IB. Now, you'll hear that acronym a lot, and it stands for International Baccalaureate, Baccalaureate pardon me, IB, or plain old honors classes themselves. Number four is solidly, solidly test scores. Now, we're specifically referring to the SAT and the ACT. Now, many schools have adopted a test optional policy in the wake of COVID-19, bully for them. Um, so this could be less important this year uh, and, and maybe moving forward. But here's the thing. Test optional, I say this to all my students, test optional does not mean test prohibited. Through a COVID lens, taking the SAT and the ACT is a differentiator on student applications for college admission. Friends, the fifth uh, factor, again, finding in the NACAC survey is essay or sample, writing sample. Now, this is the common applications, personal statement, or any other essay that's required for academic admission to a particular school. Friends, we need to remember that 90%, 90% of schools say that grades are of significant importance in the college application process. And nearly all schools are looking at your child's grades as an important Factor. And almost as many schools are caring about the strength of a student's overall high school curriculum. So let's also remember that admission teams look at a wide range of other factors for freshman admission as well. Folks, lots and lots of people ask us, why does middle school matter if colleges only look at high school grades? The most important goal during middle school years is for your child, your son or daughter, to develop strong study habits, to continue to embrace learning, of course, and to overall understand the value of education in general. Now, grades, of course, are important, but in middle school, developing the skills that you need to get those good grades is the way to make the most out of an experience. Now, Knowing this, if your child develops strong study habits now as opposed to coasting through middle school with little or no effort, that could play an important factor in how they perform in high school, in college, and of course beyond that. Lastly, 
since middle school grades only count to your high school GPA if you took high school classes. You can think of this as a transitional period for your child to get used to how high school will be and to learn how to best perform in those high school classes. So be sure that your middle schooler establishes a strong academic footing and be sure to spend some time during middle school to talk about high school and to prepare your child for those final years in his or her education. Even if your child isn't in high school yet, their grades in middle school, again, do matter to your child and their future educational experiences. Okay, friends, let's talk about high school grades or more specifically, high school GPA. Now, simply put, GPA is the condensation of your student's high school grades into one number that can be compared across all schools universally. That is a very nice and neat definition of GPA, but truth be told, there are exactly three kinds of GPAs that colleges will look at. First is an unweighted GPA, which is simply the average of a student's grades on a 4.0 scale. An A is four points, B three points, C two points, and D one point. Now, a question that I often get from parents who I'm talking to is, what if my child has a different GPA grading scale at their school? Well, friends, for the record, colleges and universities near universally will convert those GPAs into a universal 4.0 scale. The problem is that an unweighted GPA can be a disadvantage to those students who took the most challenging courses in high school. AB course, I mean, pardon me, AP courses, IB courses, International Baccalaureate again, honors courses, which is why colleges also consider a student's weighted GPA. Now, a weighted GPA gives more points or greater weight to grades in accelerated courses. Typically, this means that a B in an AP class is worth the same as an A in a non-AP class. And I should note, however, that not all schools will use a universal weighting system, which is why an unweighted GPA is still so important in the college process. The final kind of GPA that colleges will look at is called the academic GPA. Now, this is a student's GPA just in required core academic classes. This almost always de-weights GPAs that have a bunch of A's in courses like health or chorus or athletics. Colleges like to know your student's GPA, of course, but they also like to know how they received that GPA. That's why they look at all different kinds of GPA in the process. It's also why they care about the curriculum at a particular school so much. And when college admission teams start to analyze a student's high school curriculum, they're looking at three different elements. The first is, of course, core academic courses. Now, those are English and math and social studies and science and foreign languages. Colleges want to see students who have taken one course in those particular subjects at least three years and usually all four years in high school. But certainly, many students may drop one of those core courses during their senior year, but it's just one and it's just in their senior year. Next are elective courses. Now, electives describe any non-core course, but don't think that elective courses are extraneous. Your electives should be chosen for a reason. You don't have to love acting, my friends, uh, uh, with all of your heart to really enjoy a theater course. Also, uh, courses a student chooses are a great opportunity, of course, to pursue one's passions and one's interests. That's what colleges see when they look at your GPA and, of course, your high school transcript. And finally, college admission teams look at honors and advanced placement, and as we talked about already, IB, International Baccalaureate courses. And let's also remember, just for the record, that you don't have to take a full slate of honors and AB, pardon me, an IB and AP courses to stand out uh, from the crowd of other applications, but college admission offices care uh, is that you've challenged yourself during high school. And colleges are looking, of course, for students who have performed well academically, um, yet what they really, really want are students who are succeeding while taking some of the most challenging courses in their high school. That all said, let's jump to the next big idea, which is your child's high school transcript and transcripts in general. Understanding what admission teams value is only one step in the journey that takes your child from middle school to high school all the way 
through college, but there's so much more to make the journey much easier. Again, lots and lots of folks ask us, why does middle school matter if colleges only look at high school grades? And as we noted already, the most important goal during middle school is for your child to develop strong study habits, to continue to embrace learning, and of course, to value education in general. Grades, of course, are important, but in middle school, developing those skills that you need to get those good grades is the way to make the most out of the experience. Even if your child isn't yet in high school, the grades in middle school that they earn do matter to your child and their future educational experiences. Students' middle school grades are a crucial point of intervention. Students show considerable growth and declines in grades between sixth grade and eighth grade, and those changes can have strong implications for high school grades as well. Students need very high grades in middle school to improve the likelihood of earning high grades in high school. Remember, it's much easier to maintain a great GPA than it is to raise a poor one. So it's key to start the process early with good study habits and good time management habits and of course, opportunities to get extra help. Friends, when we consider school year by year, we can group ninth and 10th grades together. Let's remember these are the years that are most removed from the time when your student will actually apply to college. And the grades they receive in ninth and 10th grade are not the ones that happen immediately before their college admission applications. Hence, they're slightly less important. But remember that every grade, every grade, every class in high school still matters. The biggest thing that you can do in ninth and 10th grade is to help your students set a platform for solid grades for the overall high school picture that they'll be presenting. A random C in the ninth and 10th grade won't be a huge issue, but a bunch of Cs in ninth and 10th grades won't be great, my friends. And that C average likely won't be confined to ninth and 10th grade years alone. Another important thing that you can do during ninth and 10th grade is to encourage your child to start challenging themselves academically. Now, at most high schools, no ninth and 10th graders can actually take classes that are only exclusively AP courses. However, students may be able to take their first AP class in their freshman year or certainly in their sophomore year. Even if you're not able to do that, you can have them, have your son or daughter, take on a challenge with a higher level course and see what they can actually do, what they're actually capable of academically early on in their high school career. A final crucial thought about this is that you can be doing this in the first two years of high school. And this is something that we talk about with all of our students. Start having them develop their skills. High school, my friends, isn't just tougher than previous years of schooling because the subject areas are more advanced. The actual work in high school is harder. Moving on to 11th grade, things begin to come into very sharp focus very quickly in 11th grade. A student starts their junior year in high school and it is often termed something very specific. 11th grade is called the most important year in high school. And that's true for a couple of reasons. If middle school through the 10th grade serve as a platform for the last two years of school, well then 11th grade can feel like a very new level of academics for any one student. On the other hand, 11th grade is also set up with options for students to propel into their senior year, so it's almost a bridge between the two. Junior year is also called the toughest year in high school because it's when students begin, number one, to start actively looking at colleges, number two, participating in full in extracurricular activities, and number three, start prepping for standardized tests. A lot happens, my friends, in junior year. It's also extremely important for college admission teams across the country because this is the last full year before students apply to college that those admission folks will likely see. In fact, if your son or daughter applies early decision or early action to any school, that admission team, that admission office, will possibly only see their grades through their junior year. Now this can make application readers stress a student's performance on their junior year when making an admission decision. There's one final aspect of 11th grade that is truly significant, so we'll mention it. Now usually this is the year that has the most AP, IB, again, International Baccalaureate, or honors courses for any high school student's schedule, certainly. Students typically take many more AP courses and exams in their junior year than before, 
and 11th graders also take more AP courses than 12th graders. So, if a student doesn't do well in a junior AP course, they likely won't take another one in that particular subject area, but they are taking that AP course in that junior year schedule itself. Let's move on to the final stage. Of course, senior year, the big one, the one that we and your kids have all been waiting for. Also, one that still counts, although, of course, slightly differently than junior year in high school. Now, senior year is usually the first time that students get to exercise real choice in their college schedule. Previously, they might have been able to work with you or their counselors in selecting whether they're going to move on to an honors course or maybe not, <laughs> uh, or maybe choosing an elective sometime in their junior year. But that kind of freedom, that kind of academic freedom will come once they're seniors in high school. So just make sure that they choose wisely and don't take their senior year off, either officially in their schedule or unofficially in their attitudes. Now, that all said, senior year will have the last grades that college admission teams will see before making their final decisions on their applications. Now again, 11th grade is the last full year, but high schools send colleges a mid-year report letting colleges know how students are doing in their senior year. And if their GPA goes somewhat up or goes somewhat down in their senior year, it matters. It's, this is why you, you don't want students to let up academically in their senior year. So senioritis or apathy or disinclination or inactivity, call it what you will, the noun of your choice. <laughs> um, but folks, this is something that we should avoid as much as possible. Seniors need to keep earning the greatest grades in every single class right up through graduation. Friends, we've covered a lot of ground so far. Well done. But let's together look back at the big picture regarding high school transcripts. If application readers are seeing a student's entire high school transcript, then we need to think again about what they get from that admission process. Yes, they can follow your child's path through high school class by class and grade by grade. Nonetheless, when it comes down to evaluating whether you should get in or out, they ask this question. How does this student's transcript look compared to other students? Yes, the individual classes and the grades matter, but they matter in how they stack up against other students. Admission offices want to see that full transcript because they can better understand how each one of your students ended up where they are when they apply to college, which means it comes back down to those top line numbers that we talked about. Unweighted GPA, weighted GPA, and of course, class rank. Now these alone don't say all that much, but after seeing a transcript, college admission teams, college admission officers are a little more keyed in to what these numbers mean for each student. The full transcript gives a better understanding as to those top line numbers, and the top line numbers are a great comparison tool in the process. Your child's GPA, whether it's weighted or it's unweighted, tell admission teams how your child compares to other applicants. So, a 3.8 GPA might not really be that much better than a 3.7 depending on the school and curriculum. It's a higher number, however, when comparing to different students, and that can make, my friends, all of the difference when sorting out applications. And then, of course, there's class rank, which shows how your student compares to all of their class ranks. Now, important to say it out loud, not all high schools provide class rank. Some do show whether students were in the top 1, 5, or 10% of their high school graduating class. Others offer various GPA distribution charts. In other words, college admission teams know how strong a student is compared to the other students at their high school. That's why college admission offices want to see a whole transcript. They're making comparison, and naturally, you want your child to stand out from the crowd. Our final big idea is about how you can make sure your students' grades, and in fact, their entire high school transcript look better to college admission teams across the country. It's one thing to know the value of grades, my friends, in the college admission application process, and to view a transcript as a whole, but it takes concrete action to make sure that your student can get better grades and stand a better chance of getting into college. So let's talk about what you can do right now. 
It all starts with your child's course schedule. Now, maybe you barely thought about your child's course schedule because you or they were told what would be best and they just went with the flow. Nevertheless, you want your child to know that advocating for those courses, for their courses that they take is always important and worth some very real consideration because that's where they get a chance to make a difference in their middle school as well as their high school career at the start of each school year. I encourage students to sit, or parents, pardon me, to sit with their kids and help them when they make those choices and to do it together. That way they know the plan when they speak to their counselor. And it all begins, my friends, with the five core academic subjects. Each year students will start and should start with having an English class, math class, social studies, science class, and of course a foreign language class. That does two very real things. Number one, it gives them a very balanced schedule. And number two, it's what colleges like to see every year. For our middle schoolers, those courses tend to be a given and will serve as an introduction to the path that they'll take as they get into high school. You need them to go into almost every year knowing that they need five courses and that they should probably build on what subjects they took the previous academic year. That structure will help them be better prepared for the courses that they will take in high school, of course, and understand how the next year will use the information that they're gaining right now. Once they have those core academic subjects, you can think about what exact courses that they want to take. Specifically, you can discuss courses that they may find more challenging. Now, in middle school, challenging courses uh, themselves tend to be in the honors level courses or more advanced courses themselves. In high school, that usually means taking an AP course, an advanced placement course, an IB course, or an honors course or curriculum itself. Now, these aren't just the best classes that might be weighted uh, the most when calculating a weighted GPA, but these are the courses that are more likely to develop academic skills and abilities that we know are so important. If your student has taken an honors course in middle school, they are simply more likely to continue challenging themselves in their chosen high school courses. Challenging your student in an AP course, an IB course, an honors level course also makes them a better student overall and better prepared for, of course, college level work. Always remember to leave room for electives. Students get to start exploring electives as early as sixth grade. Electives are, of course, courses that students want to take and which allow them to do things that they wouldn't get to do in any other class. Not only does this make those classes more enjoyable, it gives them a chance to recharge and, of course, relax. Now, that helps with their grades in those five academic subjects even better College admission teams like to see students who are well-rounded, which is something that elective courses can without question do. Then slide 15. Another thing that you can do to help improve your students' scores right now is finding their strength. If you know, if they know what they're good at, you can help them focus on those strengths, perform better in those classes, and of course, enjoy school more over more. So as a guide, ask them three overlapping questions. First, which subjects are they actually good at? Have them look at their report card. Say it out loud what classes they got their best grades in, and then look back to see if there's a pattern. You might even be able to look all the way back into elementary school or middle school and see if they've always been doing well and succeeded in that one subject more than others. Maybe there isn't a pattern and it depends on the teacher or the exact material that a class was covering at the time. Now the first step is always identifying where your student has been successful. Next question, what school subjects do they actually enjoy most? Friends, this answer may very well surprise you because it's not necessarily the same as what subjects they're actually good at. They can be fascinated by history or science, but never quite gelled with the teacher that they've had for those subjects in the classroom. Knowing what they enjoy in school allows you all to think about what they might want to do in the future. Encourage them to also think about what assignments they enjoy the most out of all others. Always make sure 
that they're excelling on those and whether those assignments are essays or presentations or group projects, it doesn't matter. Finally, what do they actually like to do outside the classroom? What do they do other than academics? Think about electives or sports or these hobbies or general interests. Anything here, friends, is fair game. Video games to fantasy novels. Let the mind reel. It might not seem like this has any bearing on their academic pursuits, but please do know that they're good at what they love outside of school, and that is so deeply important to understand. It also reveals something about them inside and, of course, outside the classroom. Friends, it is a great exercise for you to do as a primary source to see how your answers match up to your child's answers. So we try to make sure that we encourage students to do this, um, I mean, parents to do this with students that are in the sixth grade, and then again in the eighth and ninth grade to see how their strengths and their interests grow over time. And remember, they might change, and that is absolutely okay because there are so many ways to foster those strengths both in and out of school. And lastly, my friends, it's also if you're looking for ways to bolster uh, your child's curriculum, joining a club that focuses on a subject area that they love is always going to be a benefit. If it's a subject they enjoy but might not excel at, of course, try academic tutoring or on-demand tutoring to boost their scores. And let's all remember, while planning a course schedule, the classroom doesn't have to make or break their success in a subject. It's a starting ground for them to succeed. Friends, I am certain that when you and your kids all look at any given week's schedule, you likely become quickly overwhelmed. Why? Because you are all human beings. Take a look, my friends, at the slide here, at our example schedule, and you'll probably think, look at Friday, there is a silly amount to do, and English essays do as a final version. And in US history, they need to have an outline for that essay that they likely pretty confidently have not even thought about yet and you certainly don't think that they're ready for a full-scale life science test come Friday as well. You're also likely thinking that I need to make sure that my child, my son or daughter is still studying for that exam plus a quiz in Algebra 1 and a very tough homework assignment. Let me let their tutor know what's actually coming up so they can be prepared. Above all else, the biggest game of the soccer season also falls on Friday night. So yes, friends, Friday is indeed crazy for our example student and likely students across the entire globe. Of course, work tends to pile up. For one day during the week, teachers ask for homework at the same time as other teachers and tests normally fall on the same day as a big game. It happens. Now, just because everything seems to be happening on the same day doesn't mean that everything cannot get done. Silver lining, my friends, your son or daughter, your student just has to make a study plan. Friends, we tell this to all of our students at the Princeton Review, the easiest way to stop from feeling assignment avalanche is to break it down into smaller pieces, of course, throughout the week and plan when things actually need to get done. Then make a plan to tick each and every one of those assignments off of the list. First, you have your child take the biggest assignments of the school week and spread them evenly across the entire time, that, that entire week. So for example, in our student example, that student would take the English essay and of course the life science exam. It is best to break down the essay into its component parts and tackle them separately throughout the week for a test reviewing different chapters on different days. We'll make sure that you hit everything that's going to be on the test and have better recall come test day. Look for breaks in a schedule. The student in our example doesn't have soccer practice on Mondays and Wednesdays. That gives more time, of course, to fit in other work. So in this case, the long-term French project, which only has to update due on Friday, that task gets taken care of early and without falling behind. There's also some Algebra 1 homework that must be done on Tuesday. And luckily, they have the time to review it with their tutor or with their study group right before the quiz on Friday. Kismet! Finally, there's the U.S. History Outline. Now, an outline, of course, doesn't require as much work as an essay, but it still requires a lot of work. It's important to know what the essay will be about, of course. Now, that's work that may take different amounts of time depending on what the student is looking at and what they get interested in actually studying. So, we recommend allowing about three days to do this task of research and build flexibility into this schedule. But also know 
what needs to get done. Now, on top of guiding your student through a particular subject, there are specific tasks. Our academic tutors at the Princeton Review are always helping students with near daily. Yes, they do know the answers to the questions themselves, but they also help students simply get the work that they need to do done. Often, friends, the toughest part of any assignment is not whether a person can actually, does actually have the knowledge they have in their noggins to do it, but are they able, are they actually able to manage the workload to complete the assignment? Friends, there's one simple but very important way that students can set themselves apart. They can ask for help. Now, we can think that since getting good grades is all about what they do to improve their GPA, better that in middle school or in high school, that it must be a solo effort and a solo effort alone. Actually, they can and should ask for help from a variety of people. It's all about lessening stress and tackling the challenges with collective solutions that we've been talking about all of this presentation. Now listen, when students ask for help academically, they can certainly work with friends and they can work with teachers and they can work with experts themselves. You know better than anyone who's going through the exact same things that your kids are regarding their schoolwork. It's their friends, it's their classmates. That's why things like study groups can be so tectonically success for so, for so many students. Now, working with friends can also be simply talking through homework assignments. If your child is unsure of how they're going to tackle a particular essay, they might have a friend who's as shaky as they are. They can talk it out, talk about why, and solve the problem together. The other thing that you can have your kids do is to work with their teachers. Obviously, they're working with your teachers already in the classroom, but they can and should work with teachers outside the classroom, whether that's office hours or extra credit assignments or a simple homework review. All are fair game and expected by teachers across the country. Now, finally, you can work with experts. For your child to work directly with an expert, getting good grades doesn't need to happen only within the four walls of a classroom. And we need to say this out loud, parents shouldn't be obliged to relearn all of their old schoolwork. Again, be that in middle school or in high school, but encourage your kid, encourage your student to pursue their interest through special programs, after school programs, during the summertime. And remember, if you need to work with somebody to help build a subject matter foundation to get a good grade and a specific chance, then you can work directly with a tutor and expert in that subject area to do just that. Folks, please know that we know that this process can be challenging, it can be confusing, or it can even be scary at times. That's why we're here. Our Princeton Review team created programs to help your family with every stage of this journey. So if there's a subject that just isn't connecting, isn't gelling with your student or a teacher that your student just isn't quite understanding in the classroom, our live online tutoring is there to help your child navigate the curriculum and master those concepts. Folks, we are very proud to say that our Princeton Review team helps over 5,000 students on any given evening. Friends, when your family is ready, the Princeton Review is here for you to navigate tests like the SAT and the ACT all the way up through the college admission journey. Folks, for over 40 years, thousands and thousands of schools and organizations have trusted our team at the Princeton Review to help students achieve their academic goals. Partnership affords your organization a variety of benefits, including information seminars that will equip, without question, your students, your parents with the most current information regarding college admission and testing and test preparation galore. And as partners, our team will design a package directly for you that addresses the unique needs of your school, your students, and of course, the families that you work with daily. Please do visit us at our virtual booth or email us directly at partnerwithusatreview.com to start this glorious conversation. This has been a pleasure talking to all of you uh, today. Again, Rob Franick, Editor-in-Chief, uh, signing off for the Prince Review. Be well. Talk to you soon.